Welcome to Season 8, Episode 12 of the Ubuntu Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be discussing getting involved Stop. in open source <laughs> communities. We'll also have some command line love, and we'll go over your feedback. I'm Alan, and joining me this week is Laura, Mark, and Martin. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. So, Laura, what have you been up to? It was my birthday. Oh, really? Many happy returns for whenever it was your birthday. Thank you. I think it was the day after the last recording. It seems a long time ago now. Mm, Almost exactly two weeks. Yeah. Um, And I got a new personal best at Parkrun. Well done, you. What, for your birthday? No, last Saturday. (laughs) Some people are so thoughtful. I know. So how how much have you trimmed off this time? Uh, Can't remember, but it's seven and a half minutes since January. Hmm. Which I think is quite a lot. I'm That's nodding impressive. sagely like that, yeah. you know. Uh, g- yeah. Given that well, I would I probably collapse and die if I tried to run 10 kilometers, anything is five impressive. Kilometers. Five kilometers. Even that, anything is impressive compared it's like think, to me. I think it was half a minute or something since last time. I can't remember. Nice one. Well done. Mm. Cool. Mark, you. how about you? Anything different happened to you? <laughs> uh, it was my birthday, but not the same birthday. Yay, what? happy birthday. <laughs> Yes, uh, and I played lots of board games with my friends for my birthday. What kind of board games? Uh, I played um, Forbidden Island, which is a cooperative board game where you've got to uh, steal treasures from an island before it sinks. Uh, And I played Contagion, which is uh, based on another game called Pandemic, where you're playing as viruses and you're trying to kill everyone. Oh, that's good, that game. Yes. Sounds good. Yeah, so the original mm. pandemic is you're trying to stop the viruses spreading and contagion. You play as the viruses against each other, trying to kill the most people. That's good fun. Mm. And then a weird game called Flux, which is a card game where the rules keep ah, changing. That's fun. Yes, Flux is great. Yes. Which Flux did you play? Um, Monty Python. Yes. That's it's very one. silly. It is very silly, yes. Awesome. Well, happy birthday to you too, Thank Mark. Thank you. Martin, was it your birthday? Uh, no, sadly not. It wasn't my birthday, but it was my 10th wedding anniversary. Yay! Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, yeah, we had a very pleasant weekend. Uh, 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 deposited my daughter with the grandparents and uh, did bugger all. Even better. Day. Brilliant. Yeah, it was really good. Really good. And uh, aside from celebrating uh, 10 years of wedded bliss, I've been uh, I've discovered... Uh, the System AU podcast. I thought that was a typo when an, you ty- when you I put did. that. I thought it was no, System no, AU or so something. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a podcast called System AU, and uh, surprisingly, it's an Australian oh. podcast uh, that covers technology and politics with a Linux uh, bias from Australia. So uh, I doubt they listen, but hello, Nick and Dan, if you uh, do listen, I'm very much enjoying. I'm up to uh, episode six. I've got one more to catch up and... If you haven't discovered System AU, I suggest you go and find it and stick it in your podcatcher. So, Excellent. Alan, was it well, your birthday? No, it was not my birthday. Mine was uh, a while ago. Uh, but I did, uh, today, yes. license some software. Oh, was it Grand Theft Auto? Ooh. No, it was a game, though. <laughs> I, I wanted to test, uh, test something, so I... Um, licensed a piece of software for a very small sum of money. Why do you keep saying then, licensed in that uh, way? Because uh, that's what I did. I but, paid oh, them some money yes. and they gave me a license to use the software. Well, that's what happens every time you pay for software, mm-hmm. isn't it? Right. Yes. And content. It's just I guess. <laughs> I, well, I am a bit, yeah, because it explicitly says that I have a license to do certain things with that software, and I did that. I Come on then, get, get off the fence. Tell us what software you licensed. Uh, what did you do good. with it? It's game, and I uploaded it to the Ubuntu mu- <laughs> the Ubuntu uh, Click Store. <laughs> so oh, make I it see. Available on uh, so Ubuntu phones. It, what did it say when you licensed it? The license said you could redistribute it. Yes, okay. uh, for one product. So I thought, yep, that'll do. <laughs> so I <laughs> stuck it in the store because I wanted to have a play and see if it would work, and it did, and I'm happy with it. So what game is it? Uh, it's called Don't Crash. Huh. It's um, it's a game where there's these two cars going around a racetrack, and you have to just not crash. And the only thing you can do is change lanes. That's oh, is only... this like that don't no brakes parking thing we played on the? Not Ooh, really. Yeah. Oh. Uh, it's it's more of like your average single 
uh, single button. I'll tell you what, get an Ubuntu phone. Thank you. But actually, <laughs> there, there is a version in the Android store, so just go and get Don't Crash and you'll see what it's like. Okay, cool. So, yeah, that's what I did. Let's get on with the show. Right, we wanted to have a bit of a chat this week about getting involved in open source communities, both from the point of view of having a project and wanting to get other people involved and how you go about that. And also, uh, if you're a person and you want to get involved in an open source project, how you do (laughs) it. if you're not a person. If you're not a person, then uh, you're probably some sort of Skynet automaton and we don't want you in our open source projects. Or or you're a cat and you're just being used as memes in everyone's open source project. Yes. (laughs) So anyway, uh, Alan, did you have some thoughts on this to start us off? (laughs) Yeah, I did. (laughs) And they're not cat related. Um, Oh. So the reason I I was thinking about this recently was because um, uh, I've seen a few uh, online communities uh, where the, uh, the contribution level has dropped and... Um, it's it it worries me a bit. There's a lot of open source uh, projects where you know there's there's fewer developers, fewer like translators, documenters, artists, you know, contributors in in any way. I'm not necessarily just limiting this to developers. Um, and I wanted to explore maybe the reasons why people don't contribute, but also how we can re motivate people to contribute to our projects. And obviously I'm speaking from the perspective of Ubuntu, um, but more specifically about the Ubuntu phone apps that, that you know, I'm interested in hearing what would stop people contributing to that. What how what would what would be a a, you know, a good reason for for you know not getting involved. Hmm. So I can speak uh, a bit about this from the point of view of I've had um, and still have to some extent several small open source projects which I've just started um, as the only developer but have brought you know additional contributors into um, and I found uh, I think the people who stuck around were um, you know I, I had a few people just you know throwing the odd patch here or there or throwing a bug report but the people who I managed to draw in and get to stick around were the people who rather than just saying you know yes I'll stick that on the list um uh, who people have actually you know i've not fixed their problem for them but i've suggested how their problem might be solved and they happen to be the kind of problem who you know the, sorry they happen to be the kind of people who would then be motivated to scratch their own itch and use the information i've given them um to start contributing and i've then sort of mentored them a bit from there on and they're the kind of people who tend to tend to have stuck around and I've had I've had that happen uh, in a few cases. One was uh, uh, in a, a, a plugin I had for Moodle, which I made several years ago, um, where I managed to um, have someone else actually take over the maintenance of it for, from me for a while, um, because That's I didn't good. I didn't have the time to do it, and he had things which needed doing. So I basically offered to show him how to get it done and get it released, um, and he was happy to take that and do it. And um, another one which I've mentioned before is my. Um, BitTorrent Sync indicator. I managed to hook up with another guy who was packaging BitTorrent Sync and suggest that he include my um, my indicator in his packages, and then we work together um, to in various aspects of getting it working, getting the packaging working in a sensible way, fixing bugs, and bringing in other contributors as well. So it sounds to me like the, I was, sorry, Martin, the, the contributions from those people were from people who were already involved in some way in the product as it were so someone who already works on moodle or already has moodle as part of their their day-to-day activities either as a community member or, or as their day job yes and yes so i think that's that's probably fair yeah right and they're they're added they're adding value or they see added value by contributing to the bit that you've done right yes and the guy who or the person who contributed to BitTorrent sync was already working on some kind of sync thing for want of a better word he was well he was he was already pa- he was packaging the BitTorrent sync program itself um right. and then um we yeah we basically managed to this grow is, this is leo Mold yes leo Mold, yeah so, so we managed about, to grow yeah. a, a sort of a group of contributors around both his packages and my open source bit 
So for those those projects that you're talking where you've got contributions, have you had any like completely green drive-by contributions? You know, someone fix something or contribute something where they weren't already involved in the project, like bring in new blood, as it were. Um. Well, I mean, everyone I suppose is, was involved in the project as a user, who's then I mean I've had some people who have like it's just been a sort of their their contribution has been a, a single patch. But it might be that they were they were a user, they found a bug, and then I said, okay, um, I don't have time to fix it, but here's what you want to look at to fix it. And then they've said, oh, okay, and a little bit later, a patch has come along from them. Right. Um, but, but until then, so, they were just using it as a user. Right. So I think it matters what they get out of it, doesn't it? So it, in your case, is that because they're using it and they're getting to do the things that they need. Yeah, exactly. They're fixing their they own just problems. Get involved in, yeah. yeah, exactly. I guess one of the things with the Ubuntu phone part is that it, because it's kind of, it's not, it, I mean, it's getting more people using it now, but there are relatively few people using it, I guess. Is that true? Um, so they have, they're not there you know they're not able to just fix their own things at the moment they've got to be enticed in some other way to get involved right that's exactly it i and and if if you're not using it on a daily basis it's not you know mm. your your device that you use as your or you know the software isn't something you use as part of your normal workflow or isn't something you go to on a regular basis your your motivation level for contributing to that thing is lower um mm. yeah. because you know why would you you know exactly yeah yeah, I mean, unless unless well, what you're hoping to do is become, you know, a contractor who develops Ubuntu apps for companies. Right. I mean, I know a lot of people who developed free apps for iOS and Android did so because then they can use that as a, you know, uh, then companies come to them and say, oh, can you develop an app for us? And I know quite a few people who've, you know, made successful businesses or got jobs through doing that. Um, That's true. But yeah, other than that, unless you you use the Ubuntu phone and what you want to do is you know, contribute in ways that help your usage of it or help the community because you like the community. Right. And that's that's how, you know, in the past, the, the desktop contribution was easy because if you have a PC and you've got, you know, you can download the ISO image, you can become a user very, very easily. Whereas yeah. with mobile devices, it's, there, there's quite a, mm. a barrier to becoming a user of that device yes. it's not just a case of installing it on your phone because there are only a limited set of phones that it works on yes. and if that's your only device let's say you're a student and you don't have money to burn on lots of different devices to play with then and that's or, your you know you're device. a normal person and you don't go out and buy lots of phones all that yeah uh, but they exist they, apparently. <laughs> but then isn't isn't the 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 way to break down that barrier uh to have as it's hopefully going to be in not too long a time have it so that the code base you run on your desktop is the same as on the phone then contributing to the phone is just contributing to ubuntu as a whole yeah and and i think that will help you know there are all the there are all these little things that 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 chip away like the fact that the code is out there you know it's not just a demo being shown off at mwc the fact that the code is available to download and it's you know gpl licensed so anyone can can grab hold of it the fact that it does run on the desktop and it has you know, always run on the desktop like for example the music app has always been able to run on the desktop but it's it's not what someone would probably use as their primary music app because they've already got time and invested in another app like Rhythmbox or banshee mm. or, or whatever and so you know making someone move across to something which has fewer features just so that they can contribute to it is quite a barrier mm. the, the other thing is that, that strikes me just from this conversation and is that we're talking about uh, contributing code in that you need to have some sort of development capability or the time to learn some development skills in order to contribute to a project. And there's lots of ways that you can contribute to a project and make a difference, uh, and I don't mean financially, without actually having to be a developer. And those routes into a project can actually be a good on-ramp to get people engaged in the project, to get them interested, to that will then take them naturally into an area where they they learn other development related skills and they can right. play an even bigger part in the in. But the some project. of those are actually quite um, hard to get to anyway. So, for example, you know, 
documentation yeah. is hard if you don't actually have access to the thing that you're trying to document. Translations is one of those things that actually many people can do, but if you only know one language, then you're a little bit stuffed. This is um, true. Where, and, and not everybody's good at writing documentation either. True. And support also true. is also <laughs> another one where, you know, if you're, if you're going to give... Um, like, we have a lot of people who sit on websites like Ask Ubuntu and the forums and on IRC, and the reason they can give advice is that they've seen stuff before and and because mm. this is there's a lot of new stuff here it's a lot harder for them to get bootstrapped even with the non-development tasks like support and documentation mm. and and that kind of stuff so it's actually but there's, there's, there's quite a lot of there's a couple of other areas we can't get contributions for also um areas where you can get involved is if somebody raises a bug and it's a poorly documented bug because you see this a lot <laughs> you know somebody li literally says it doesn't work what other users of the project can do is come along and look at those bug reports and do bug triage which yeah. is well can i ask some questions and get some better answers from the person that reported this can i reproduce the problem can i create a reproducible way of demonstrating this bug so then the developers have got something better to go on and, and i can't tell you how valuable having somebody do that is uh, for your project um, because bug triage is a real time hole you could that's a full-time occupation so having a group of people who are prepared to learn your platform and your system and ask questions and get information out of people um, and also do things like tally up this is a duplicate of that bug and uh, this is very similar to this bug and do the cross-referencing is a really really useful uh thing you can do for a project yeah you're absolutely right we i mean we have teams of well we have had i don't know how active they all are but i i know some people still reply to you know bug reports and uh, uh help prioritize them and tag them and yeah reword the description or, or mark them as duplicates and do all that kind of triage work it's certainly you know as valuable as the person filing the bug in the first place is getting the you know the information in it clarified but then some of those people st there still needs to be some level of knowledge of the product i mean and, and some of that comes over time you know you know that actually this isn't a bug in unity 8 it's a bug in system settings or this isn't a bug in the music app it's actually you know the the media playback framework underneath or something and and because that's all very new it's very hard for even bug triages to to get a handle on well where is this bug you know is it, is it actually in the in this app or is it in that app or is this a high priority or not and i think part of that is because um it's it's not all public you know there are there are conversations with hardware partners like meizu and bq that happen behind closed doors and we don't know or publicly people don't know what those priorities are you know it could well be that it's a super high priority for you know some handset manufacturer that music app has to be has to be the like the primary app on the phone they're, they're, all, they're all about media and that's that's all they ever do all day and all their users want is some way to play all their music and that that needs to be articulated you know those kind of you know interesting tidbits of information so that people know where to focus their attention and it's sometimes quite hard to to do that when there are you know private conversations going on whereas in a in the ubuntu desktop world everything was very much more open um you know than than it is when you're when you've got commercial relationships with with partners hmm. the other thing i'd say and i'm i'm guilty of this is that um open source projects tend not to have a very clear um description of how people can get involved in the project in different ways and this is something that i'm looking to um address soon because it's been pointed out on a number of occasions and i'm getting increasingly more people asking on a daily basis how do they get involved and when i read the website i think yeah it isn't clear where people get started 
you need to identify the different ways in which people can contribute to a project. So we've talked about um, testing and bug triage and translation and artwork and theming and development. And each of those areas need to be clearly identified with a handful of clear steps as this is where you go, this is how you get started, this is how you can start to contribute. And with regards to yeah. things like development, what's really useful is actually saying these are some of the things that we're planning to work on, these are ideas where you could, you know, actually start making this thing or, or developing this particular feature. Um, and I had to have this pointed out to me by somebody recently. You, you know who you are. Thank you very much for talking to me. Um, uh, but yeah, it seemed obvious once it had been pointed out. But yes, uh, open source projects are not great at actually explaining how to get involved to people. And consequently, the people that tend to get involved are the people that are prepared to download the source code and work it out for themselves. Right. Um, so you get few... Uh, participations that way i suppose a less diverse group of people as well quite yes. yeah so um we'd be interested to hear from you dear listeners what you think about this topic if you uh, are part of a project that's been either particularly successful or particularly unsuccessful in uh, in getting additional contributors let us know what you do to try and uh, try and get more or if you have um been involved in uh, in open source projects how you got your your start now it's time for command line love <laughs> <laughs> oh dear need a bit There's more practice that, that maybe good. yeah i definitely yeah. do i also need a glass of water <laughs> 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 so we do have a command line love this yep. week um as you might remember from a few episodes ago we use an application called audio recorder to locally record each of our audio streams when we're doing the podcast an audio recorder has a nifty feature whereby you can uh, all type in a start time and all of our uh, systems start recording at the same time. But of course, this only works if our clocks and our computers are all synchronized at the same time. And traditionally, uh, you would use something like NTP date to do the clock synchronization, but um, that is deprecated. So uh, the question is, how do you synchronize your clocks on your Ubuntu computer if NTP is a deprecated tool? So um, our command line love this week is simply NTP. So um, there was a little bit of discussion uh, pre-show uh, as to whether NTP was installed by default or not. So the first thing you need to do is make sure that NTP is installed on your machine. And that's a simple apt-get install NTP. Uh, and that will start the daemon and that will uh, poll a timing service and uh, slowly keep your clock in sync. So it will make small incremental adjustments over the course of uh, days or weeks until your clock's in sync with the uh, the atomic time services. But if you want to force a time synchronization, what you need to do is first stop the daemon. So sudo service ntp stop. And uh, NTPD uh, then has some uh, facilities in it to uh, replace the functionality that NTP date used to have. So it has a uh, minus G switch, a minus Q switch, and a minus X switch. Uh, and I won't explain what all of those do, other than it's the minus Q switch that mimics the behavior of NTP date. So once you've stopped the NTP service, you run a sudo NTPD minus gqx and after a few seconds it will display uh, what the uh, time slew on the synchronization was uh, and it, for good measure you could uh, run ntpd minus gqx a couple of times just to make absolutely certain uh, your clock has synced and then you can uh, restart the uh, ntp daemon with sudo service ntpd uh, ntp start and that is what we're now doing at the start of every recording to make sure our clocks and therefore our audio recordings are in sync with one another. Sweet. Does it, um, do you need to tell it what server to connect to? Or does it just know? 
it takes no it knows it's uh, i think it's in uh, etc either ntpd.conf or ntp.conf right. um but by default on ubuntu systems it's ntp.ubuntu.com and cool. uh you're running operating systems have their own sorry you're running 1504 now aren't you and that's running is uh, that's got um system d right Correct. and the, it's still service service name stop and stop exactly just like because upstart because someone clever has wrapped the old, ah, right. uh, you know, upstart in it scripts around uh, system D, so you don't have to learn the new system CTL way of doing Excellent. things. You can do things in the same way you used to, and it will work on your traditional inits and upstarts and system Ds in just the same cool. way. Awesome. So, so why do you need to force the sync? Ah, uh, because the way NTP works is it doesn't want to make big time jumps all at once because that can upset some of the services running on your machine so it works out what the time slew on your machine is and it slowly uh corrects it so it can take you know a couple of weeks to bring a machine oh, into right. sync with the atomic clocks and by doing this you force it to correct itself to the right time right now and don't be um uh uh, conservative about it, just do it right now. Awesome. Thanks for that. And it's time for some feedback. Uh, so Ken Fallon from Hacker Public Radio emailed in about our audio woes in the last recording session. Heard your audio woes on Season 08, Episode 9, Baby Geniuses, and was wondering if audiophonic.com would have helped. I managed to rescue an absolutely terrible show using it, and I'd be interested to hear how you got on. It's free for limited use. Huh. So Never I took of it. No, nor had I. I took a look at it, and it did... Uh, it improved the the track that we had trouble with to an extent. Unfortunately, it didn't uh, didn't solve all of the issues, but it would have it would have been a good first step had I known it existed. It would have saved me quite a bit of time. So uh, yeah, that's it's quite good. Basically, you upload an audio file and you can have it converted to various formats and tagged in various ways, and you can also run through various processes to reduce noise and normalize volume and things like that. The kind of things that we do when we're post-processing the show like an online version of audacity basically not it's not yeah. really like i mean you don't get a waveform which you can edit you literally just upload it and then tick the boxes for the things you want it to run and it does them and you get a file back which has been processed hmm. nice cool. well next time we make a horlix of the show we know where yes. to go yeah we did work out what the problem was i had the wrong source selected on the audio recording oh, yes. a future reference i know so easily done on the subject of sound, Super Engineer um, tweeted us at, at, at Ubuntu Podcast. That scream at the end of the last podcast, who just broke, killed, offended, sacrificed, what? That was me. Yeah. That was me just going stop, but with the, the weird distortion added. Yeah. Oh. Sorry about that. It wasn't a scream, really. <laughs> no, it was it was it was normal talking, but it just uh, it was me just going stop. Yeah, I should have uh, probably cut that bit out. <clears throat> <laughs> Won't happen again. And Paul Gear emailed. Thanks for your explanation about audio in episode eight. One thing that I don't understand is why your theme music is so much louder than your <laughs> voices. I literally have to halve my volume when it comes on. What like this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just like I do on these odd occasions when I watch commercial TV any chance you can do some volume levelling well hopefully this should be a little bit quieter than uh, it was previously we have adjusted that and, uh, yes yeah, thanks for letting us know because place. until people best, tell yeah, us or, that it's too loud or, we, uh, we don't really... or we've got it wrong and your ears are <laughs> yes. bleeding yeah and you didn't hear <laughs> any of that uh, even <laughs> didn't hear your own email being read out <laughs> Basically, it's hopefully fixed. Yeah. Yes. Uh, James Byrne emailed in. I was recently drawn into the Linux Foss community by the Linux Voice podcast. Very good podcast. I enjoy mm, that one. Very good, very good. Um, but I found that I was hearing all, about all of these topics, which I didn't really get, since they seem to have happened a year or two ago. 
That's where your podcast came in. Wait, what? <laughs> when we're up to date. I started at season one and have just finished the latest episode of season eight. It has provided me with a lot of great information and viewpoints about how the community works and what FOSS is about. That's since January. He's listened to eight seasons, wow. seven and a half seasons. That is Poor an guy. endurance listener there. <laughs> well done, James. So I wanted to write to say thank you for all the brilliant content and hard work that you've put into the podcast. It's been a pure joy to listen to ye and hear your opinions. I have to figure out what I'm going to listen to now. Well, you can keep listening to us because we come out every week. <laughs> P.S. I've always found the sound quality grand. The content is the most important thing. He's not caught thank up with this much. season. That's what we think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And at Just Caracas tweeted us. Here I am, not buying a BQ, waiting for the Maizu, and then even more, an even more exciting phone is announced. What? what? Hashtag really? waiting really? game. This, I think he's referring oh, the to uh, Mark Shuttleworth's yes. mm. UOS, isn't yes, he? Yes, probably. I know nothing about that, so. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. I don't think that's entirely true. You're breaking Alan up. has his NDA face on. <laughs> <laughs> You're breaking up. Hamish Downer emailed following in... Following in... Oh. Yeah, he emailed us anyway in response to our discussion about mobile browsers. <laughs> so professional. Uh, the reloading of pages in the Android web browser has annoyed me a lot over the years, but I switched to Firefox on Android, and while I can't swear it never happens, I can't remember being annoyed by it since. Actually, Actually we, um, yeah, I, I use. Sorry, we got Carry a tweet on. from a uh, friend of the show, Stuart Language, who said uh, they do it intentionally because they can't. Uh, browsers can't retain all of the content uh, for the page, so they have to forcibly reload it, including, like, for example, all the JavaScript that goes with mm. uh, the page, which is why it's just easier for them to forcibly reload it all. Right. I bet someone clever like Stuart Language could work out a better way of doing yeah, it. Yeah, fix it, Stuart. And finally, Alex Baggett left a message on the website. Don't change the music. Never change the music. <laughs> I like and it. on that note... That's all for episode 12. Ooh. Yes. We'll be back next week when we'll have more news, comment and discussion and... And a special guest. Yes. And a guest presenter. Who's that? Not telling. Do you actually know? Yes. Him? How dare you? Oh. <laughs> I thought it was going to be the Poppy and Mark no, cast it's, again. It, it was all organised. Oh, everyone loves the Poppy and Mark show. Yeah. Yes, they do. Especially the ones Nobody that Nobody ever lost. heard it. <laughs> Bye. 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 Goodbye.